zu können. Also, ich habe Mathematik studiert und arbeite jetzt in theoretischer Physik. Man war mich wie Feuer ist, ich arbeite mit GUI und Functional Reactive Programming, über das er hier auch einen Vortrag hält. Das war mich ganz besonders, weil ich habe auch mit GUI gearbeitet und was mich immer stört, ist diese Single-Thread-Geschichte, in dem GUI kann. Und ich hoffe mir, dass ich durch Functional Reactive Programming diese Single-Thread weggeht. Mal sehen, ob es stimmt oder nicht, ich weiß nicht. Ähm, aber es wird jetzt zu weit. Ähm, Anlieg Apumus zu Functional Reactive Programming. Alright, so um, the talk will be in English. Oh. <laughs> so may I introduce you again in English? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce you Heinrich Apfelmus now in English. He studied mathematics. He's now working working in theoretical physics. And I'm happy because he's working in uh, graphical user interfaces and functional reactive programming. From which I hope that we'll we'll get uh, rid of the single threaded application uh, the GUI applications. But this talk will be about functional active programming, so looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction and thank you for uh, inviting me to Vomcom and uh, allowing me to speak here about functional active programming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I forward to have the opportunity to enjoy uh, several marvelous talks, for instance by Andrew about servants, but uh, and um, uh, today, or right now, I will be talking about functional reactive programming. I'm not sure uh, if it was of the single threaded <laughs> programming model, uh, um, but I think it's a very promising approach for uh, uh, writing any kind of interactive application, be it a desktop application or a web interface. So, uh, it's still, so functional reactive programming is still fairly new. Uh, libraries for doing it, uh, let's say, properly uh, have only emer emerged in recent years. I have written one of these libraries, it's called Reactive Banana, and that's basically why I'm here talking about it. So I will give a section on different libraries at the very end. Um, okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about, I will start with some history, um, and then I will go into functional reactive programming proper, properly and uh, try to ex explain at least the core ideas of what functional reactive programming is and why it's a good idea. And I will also show that it's not just an idea, you can also put it into code, so I will have several code examples. Um, and the examples will be in Haskell, so uh, it's called functional reactive programming and uh, uh, it was developed in the context of functional programming uh, as you may have guessed from the name, and that's why Na Haskell is a natural choice uh, as a host language, so to speak. But um, I've tried to keep the example very simple, so that uh, even people who don't know very much Haskell can also understand that. Um, okay, so, uh, and if you have any questions, short questions during the talk, please do interrupt me. Uh, uh, otherwise, at the end of the talk, you might have forgotten a question that was so pressing at that moment. All right, let's do some history first. Uh, I would think it's fair to say that the graphical user interface began in 1968. So this is still, uh, it's uh, over 40 years now. And uh, when Douglas Engelbart and his team uh, showed the first system, the very first graphical user interface in a demonstration that was later called the mother of all demos because this is uh, basically the first uh, PowerPoint presentation that was ever given, I believe. Uh, and this system was quite revolutionary and included things such as the mouse, so this device that controls the point of the screen that was invented um, by him and his team, but they also had hyperlinks, so you could click on text inside, and, and they also had video conferencing, so on the screen you had a smaller screen, but there was a moving picture of someone else and they could talk to each other. And they could even do shared screen edit editing. So he, he was, that was Engelbert, and uh, he had a mouse pointer, and the other guy had actually a second mouse pointer too, so there were two mouse pointers on the screen. Uh, everything in 1968, so this was quite uh, groundbreaking at the time. And it, yes, and many more things as well. Um, and there's also a YouTube version of this, uh, so you can watch either the whole talk or you can watch a playlist which features the best parts and it's a bit shorter. And I can definitely recommend to watch that one. Um, 
Um, by the way, uh, Douglas Engelbart was, or his main mo motivation was a concept called, he called augmented intelligence. So he was not interested in artificial intelligence where computers think for themselves, but he wanted uh, to augment uh, intelligence so that the human becomes smarter or becomes better at performing intellectual tasks by using a computer. And maybe mm, the extreme form would be probably the cyborg where a machine directly uh, improves your brain function. Um, and I think uh, it's quite fair to say, or I would say, that uh, his vision back then uh, has become a reality today. So uh, when I write a letter, I do it on a computer. When I write uh, a document, well, formulate it as a ther theoretical physicist, I use a computer. And when I give a presentation, well, I'm using some augmented intelligence here. And well, if you look at the way that some people are glued to their smartphones, you might think that even the cyborg had become a reality already. <laughs> anyway, so, but what I find uh, uh, Equally remarkable about his system was not, was not just uh, what it did do, but also how he programmed it, so how it was implemented. And, and they actually had to write, or they did write, several uh, high-level languages, and they changed the languages as they uh, wrote the system. So the languages evolved together with the system, and uh, I don't think they could have written it any other way. So. Uh, writing a groundbreaking system required new concepts uh, in programming languages as well. Then the next milestone in the development of the graphical user interface is, I would say, uh, the introduction of the Xerox Auto computer, this machine here. They had a weird uh, screen ratio, they had a portrait orientation. It was introduced in 1973. And where Zagler's Engelbart system uh, was written still on a mainframe computer, this was a machine that you could actually buy and it would fit on your desk at home or at work. Uh, but equally important as what the system did, I think, is also what the, how the system was implemented. So uh, this machine introduced the first object-oriented programming language ever presented. Uh, uh, developed by Alan Kay and co-workers, and it's called Smalltalk. And I've, uh, I've actually heard that some people have used Smalltalk here. So this was the first one, Smalltalk, the first object-oriented programming language, and uh, today, of course, object-oriented programming has become mainstream, for, especially for writing graphical user interfaces. And, but again, uh, the message is that well, to develop revolutionary systems, you have, to learn, you have to work in the language department as well. You have to make them revolutionary as well. Well, and uh, I guess everyone can guess now where this is going. I think for writing graphical user interfaces, it's still, even in the object-oriented paradigm, it's still quite complicated and quite difficult. And I think it's time for a new step in the evolution of programming paradigms. and. Um, I personally believe that the right step would be functional reactive programming. This one is a bit younger, uh, first described in 1997 uh, in a seminal paper by Colonel Elliott and Paul Luda, and then entitled Functional Reactive Animation. Uh, the name has changed a bit since then. Now we call it, we like to call it functional reactive programming. And it's basically a declarative way to, pro to program with data that changes over time. Okay, so that was a very, very short version, and now in the uh, rest of the talk, I'm going to explain what this actually means and uh, how it came about, so that you can understand the viewpoint where this uh, comes from. Um, it's no accident that this was uh, invented in the context of functional programming, and that's why we have to look a bit at functional programming first. I'm not entirely sure if everyone uh, uh, now says go from uh, bottom to Anyway, so we have to look at functional programming first. Okay, so every high language, high level language, say C or Python or Java, has a concept of functions. So these are just reusable code blocks, and you can pass parameters to them, and they may return results. But a functional language takes functions seriously. In a function language, functions are data, like strings, integers, hash tables, 
functions. They're data. You can supply them as arguments, you can get them as results, and you can take two functions, put them in as arguments, and get another function back. So you can combine these things as well. They're just an ordinary data type. And now I would like to explain uh, uh, how exactly this works. OK, so by means of example. OK, so here we have a function. I've called it R. It has one argument, an integer, and it, return, it returns a true or false value, a Boolean value. And it returns true if the integer is odd, so 3 uh, would be not integer, and it returns false if the integer is <coughs> even. So this is a very simple function. And now we have a different function, let's call it filter. It takes as its first argument, not an integer, not a string, not a hash table, but a function. And as its second argument, it takes a list. And uh, if you take, for example, filter applied to function R, applied to list 1, 2, 3, 4, what the filter that function does, it uh, returns a list of all the elements where this first argument returns true. So we would be filtering all the odd elements from this list, and so the, these elements are 1, 3, the odd elements in this list. But we can also apply a different uh, argument in the first place. So, if you want to have all the even elements, we can say filter even, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we get 2, 4. Okay, so this was functions as arguments. And uh, to be uh, honest, you can also do this in uh, very primitive high-level languages. So even in C, you can do that. Uh, there is a standard function, uh, a function in the standard library called Quicksort, and you can supply an argument, which is a function pointer. So you can do this in C as well. So this is one half of functional programming. The other half of functional programming, or the important half, is that you can return functions as a result. So let's take another example. Here's a very simple function. I call it int for increment. It takes an integer and returns an integer that is 1 plus the previous one. And now here is a, or the prototypical key function of functional programming. It returns a function. So this thing introduces the fact that the right hand side is a function. And in this case, I've written it in operator notation. So the first argument is, lift, is written to the left of the function name, and the second argument, g, is written to the right of the function name, and the function is called dot in between. It's like plus or times for multiplication or addition. But uh, other than the fact that you write it in between the arguments, there's no really difference. And it does the following. It, if you give it to the function, two functions, you get a function which first applies the second argument and then applies the first argument. So let's take an example. Uh, imagine that you want to increase an integer not by one but by two. One way to write this is, well, I know how to increase integers by one. So I take the function which increases it by one and I combine it with, with the function that increases it by one. And then I would get a function that increases everything by 2. I mean, this is not necessarily how you would write it in code, but I think it's a very interesting way. And certainly, if you have more complicated examples than adding numbers to integers, and then this uh, would be very uh, useful indeed. And just to uh, make the point, if you want to increase an integer by 3, you can do that by uh, taking the increment of two by 2 and incrementing by 1, and you combine those and get this uh, result. Um, any questions? Yeah, hopefully. Very simple. Here. Yeah. All right, and now that we know that functions uh, are first class values, they are also code, so they are actually data types, we can have a look at the first uh, major concept of functional reactive programming and consider the following type. We call it a behavior, and we define it simply as a function from time to values of a certain type A. And so this is a function, it's an ordinary data type. So if functions were data types, then the address must be data types too. And we can interpret this as something uh, as a value that changes over time. So a value of type behavior, well, it, it's something that changes over time because 
uh, on the right hand side, for every moment in time, uh, this thing returns the value at this moment in time. And we can interpret the whole thing as a package of a value that is changing over time. Okay, and you can visualize this in a small diagram. You have the time axis here horizontally and vertically you have the whole <coughs> axis and you can draw a curve as how the value changes over time. And uh, the point of functional reactive programming is that this is a very useful concept. So what are things that change in time? Well, for instance, uh, in an animation, in the position of things to be animated, well, it's certainly something that changes over time. So you uh, may want to model it as a behavior. Or if you imagine a text field where the user can input something like a password or this username, uh, this would correspond to text value, and certainly it's not constant in time. If the user inputs something, then it will change. And you can also model this by your behavior. And to take uh, yet another example, uh, if you're playing a piece of music, you have this volume slider, and certainly this may change over time, so it can be a good idea to model it as behavior as well. Um, so, yes, question? Uh, what's time then? Uh, time is simply, uh, I would. Okay, I would simply, it's a floating point volume, so 1.5 seconds, for instance. Okay, and, but let's see that you can actually, this is not just an idea, you can write code for that. And I have prepared a little example. So, this is the example. We are at the Bob conference, so we certainly need a Bob at some point. And this is the Bob. We have a pendulum, and we have a Bob moving. And uh, the point here is the code on the right hand side. So I have actually implemented the Bob as a function from time. Time is a floating point volume. Uh, to well, it's it's a point, so it consists of two coordinates, x and y. And the position of the bob is calculated like this. Uh, so the angle that the pendulum makes here changes over time, and it changes periodically. So we use some kind of sine function here, which is periodic. And then we have to apply trigonometry to get the actual position of the bob of the pendulum. OK, and, this, uh, and then we have a function called animate, which takes this behavior, uh, which is just a data type like any other data type, and renders it. And rendering the part is below here, which I will not show. OK, so we have this mesmerizing pendulum here, which I will stop now. OK, so this is something that you can put into actual code. Now, I said that um, behaviors are data types like any others. So you can supply them as arguments. And you can also return them as results. And there are several very useful functions that you can think of or write for behaviors. And one of them, a very simple one, is called uh, fmap. The name is pretty, uh, yeah, well, not esoterical, but uh, it may not be uh, apparent at the first at the first sight, but uh, this function is still very useful nonetheless. If we have, uh, it takes a function as argument, and it takes a behavior as argument, and it returns the behavior again as argument. And what it simply does is it takes the behavior and at every moment in time it applies this function. Okay, so let's look at, the, at, at an example this may be easier to understand. So we have here fmap and if I apply the function reverse here, so reverse acts on a string and simply reverses the string. So uh, from left to right it uh, simply writes from right to left. And if we have a text box here I said that we can model text boxes as behavior string. So it's a, a string volume that changes over time. And now if we apply fmap reverse to that, then we get a string volume, which is always, at each moment in time, it's always the reverse of the input string box. OK, and I also have to show you that this is not just a neat slide that you can make here, but it actually works in practice. So we have here fmap reverse of the text box and the Oops. 
So it, it, it does it exactly what I said it would do. And the thing is, this is also the actual code for this. So we have an input element here, and I get a behavior out of that. It's called input, behavior string. And what I do in my code is I write an fmap reverse of input, and then I get the output, and then I have to, uh, it's called thing here, I have to route back, read back the output uh, into some kind of text element, and this is what happens here. And this is actual code. I, had, I didn't have to do any fancy, uh, well, I didn't have to write few wins or anything. I can write it like this, and it will automatically have this behavior that um, reacts, it reacts instantaneously. OK, so much for this example. OK, so behaviors are very useful indeed. This is one of the things you can do with behaviors. And this was line, one line of code. Now, there is a second uh, important concept in functional reactive programming. And to introduce that, um, you know, we have to look at the map and data type, which uh, is not immediately available in other high-level languages, but which is not even immediately available in many functional languages, but it is available in, in Haskell, in a lazy functional language. And this data type is uh, infinite lists. So, what you see here, uh, one dot dot, uh, this is a perfectly valid Haskell expression, if I write it down, what this value means is, well, it's simply the infinite list of integers starting at 1. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, and all the way to infinity. So it never stops, the list. And certainly what you should not do is trying to print this list, because this will <laughs> take infinitely long time, which you don't, probably don't have. <laughs> OK, so, but what you can do is you can say, take the first four elements. So if you have this uh, predefined function, some list, it's called take four, take the first four <coughs> elements, and of this infinite list, I would get the elements one, two, and three, and four. Uh, but I can also say, say the first seven elements. So the first seven elements of the, this infinite list are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, it, it may be useful to think of an infinite list as an actual data type as something that always returns the next element. So internally, of course, you, you can't store infinitely uh, uh, many bytes. Uh, that's just impossible. But internally, it's represented as something that, well, it has a starting value, and it has, then it has uh, a procedure to tell you how to get the next one. So if you're programming, say, in Python, then you could think of this as an iterator, which just always returns the next element, no matter how often you ask for the next element. Um, but uh, I would say it's, uh, while, while this brings it back down to Earth, thinking of it in terms of potentially <coughs> infinite this, I think I would say it's a good idea to think of this as an actually infinite list. So the, we, the implementation is a bit different from the viewpoint in this case. But I would say that this viewpoint is useful. OK, and now what infinite lists are, we can already take a look at the second important concept of functional reactive programming. And this is the event. Or, well, for historical reasons, it's called event. I would say it's more like an event stream of potentially infinitely many events or event occurrences. So the type event of A is simply a list of pairs of a timestamp and a volume. So these are uh, called event occurrences, and they happen at particular points in time. And here's also, again, a visualization. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you have time. And here you have the volume, and then at separated points in time, you have your event happening. And the most basic example would probably be mouse clicks in a graphical user interface. So every time you click the mouse in the GUI, then you would see one of these uh, event occurrences. And another example would be if you play a piece of music on a keyboard and want to transport this into the computer, then every note that you play would correspond to, uh, to an event occurrence in an event stream this time with different values depending on which key you have pressed. Or you sim simply take the computer keyboard. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's a good idea to keep this as a separate con uh, concept from behavior. So a behavior model is something that uh, is always defined at every point in time. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to model mouse clicks as a behavior. I think it's more natural to model them as an event. That's why we have two different 
types. Uh, I'm saying this because there are some libraries which try to merge these types into one. I think it's uh, not such a great idea. All right, and just as we, as we had functions and behaviors and different lists as data types, uh, we can pass them as arguments and we can return them as results. We can also do the same thing in this case. So here is an example uh, of a very useful function on events. So it's called meaning will. As the first argument, it takes a function, uh, which we can ignore for now, and it takes an element, uh, an event, sorry, the first uh, event argument and the second event argument, and it returns another event. And what this function does, it simply uh, merges these two event streams. So the events from event occurrences from the first stream are matched with the second one. So the second one and here is a visual visualization of that. So here is the first argument, and I have uh, drawn the event occurrences as uh, yellow stars. And here you have the second uh, uh, event, and I've drawn the occurrences as, as the dots. And if you apply union work to that, well, you get uh, both pictures in one, essentially. And so you have both the stars and the red dots. Of course, and these have the same type, so the type is always A, but uh, to better uh, distinguish them in this example, I have drawn them differently. And for the first argument, note this point here. Uh, it may happen that two event occurrences uh, occur at exactly the same time. I mean, this will probably never be true for external events. Like, if you have two separate mouses and you have two clicks, they will never be simultaneous. But if you have, if you're writing a program and you take the mouse click and uh, it goes into one part of your program, but it also goes in another part of your program, and then you want to merge these events again, then it may well happen that the that events are simultaneous. And this is when this first function comes in. It tells you how to merge two event values. So this will be this case. You have to merge them somehow. All right, um, it's a bit more difficult to visualize uh, events in a graphical user interface. Behaviors are easier, so I will simply uh, uh, postpone the example for now. And I will try to explain, oh, wait, well, no, no, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, let me go back for a moment. Um, this point of events occurring simultaneously, um, this is a very important point for functional reactive programming. Um, you've probably heard a talk, on, or, or there was a talk on React uh, this morning. So uh, reactive programming is very similar to functional reactive programming. It uses the same ideas or similar ideas. And, uh, but one point where they differ crucially is uh, the point when two uh, events happen simultaneously. In React, uh, in the React uh, family of libraries, um, the result is somehow undefined. One event may happen before the uh, other or after the other, whereas in functional reactive programming, again, it's simultaneously. And uh, this is actually important uh, in code. So if you have this, you can avoid a certain number of bugs. In the reactive family, they are called glitches. Uh, you, don't, you simply don't have them in uh, FRP, so this will be glitch-free from from the beginning. So this is uh, the distinction between functional reactive programming and the family of libraries that are called reactive programming. All right, so uh, you may wonder, uh, okay, so well, these ideas might be uh, very interesting if they lists and functions as data, and they may perhaps even be mind-blowing, but are they any good? What do I get from these ideas? So what do they, yes? Yes. Is there a constraint that these events should be ordered by time or, or no? Uh, yes, they should be ordered by time. Yes, you're right. So if, if I were to take this definition here, then you're right. Uh, this implementation would need uh, a further constraint that the time values are ordered. Yes, you're, you're right. Uh, of course, uh, in a library, uh, you will never see this type on the right hand side. This will be an abstract data type and you simply supply the functions, uh, which has this building, so to speak. Okay, so why is this a good idea? Why does this give you something that you could not get otherwise? And let's have a look at a very simple example. So we have uh, a graphical user interface consisting of two buttons, one button labeled up and one labeled down, and the counter 
which can go up or down, depending on which button you press. And, well, if you are a programmer and want to use traditional uh, object-oriented programming techni techniques, you would write it something like this. So, I declare the counter first, it has an initial value of zero, and uh, then, yeah, so this would be one line of code, and then in another part of my code, code I would define an event handler on click up, so when the up button is clicked, I would send a message to the counter to increase its head by one, please. Okay, so I've written this in kind of functional notation, um, but the plus one should be apparent. And then in a third part of my code, I would define an event handler for the down button, and I would write counter, and I would send a message to the counter to decrease by one place. And the key thing to notice here is that uh, these are three separate uh, blocks in your code. Uh, if you ask the question, okay, so I have this graphic user interface and it has some bug somewhere, and somehow the counter doesn't work correctly, and then you want to know, of course, well, what are the pieces in my code that can change this counter? What you have to do is, well, this is the definition of counter, but this is just the initial value. If you want to find out what changes this counter, you have to look at your entire code base. There is no way around it. You have to look at all the places where this variable counter appears, because all these places could change the counter. So if you want to find out the dependencies of this counter, you have to look at the entire code base. There is no way around that. In the traditional uh, object-oriented way. If you use, however, functional active programming, then the point is that it might look syntactically a bit more upward, but the point is you have the single definition. And here, the counter, well, how is, what are the dependencies of this counter value? Well, you have, it depends on a click up event from the up button, and the click down event from the down button, and you say, okay, these events correspond to decreasing the counter and to uh, increasing the counter, and then we uh, merge these two event streams with the function I've previously shown, and then here's something that I will not explain, but which keeps track of state. So we have an initial volume, and these things update the state. You just have to read on that one. Okay, and the key point, the key message of functional reactive programming is if you want to find, if you want to find out the dependencies, you have to look at a single line of code, namely the definition. And, well, the definition may be complicated, so you have ch to chase down the dependencies of the dependencies. But what you do not have to do is look at your entire code base. Okay, and let me show this in an example. So here the counter goes up, goes down, and on the right hand side you see the code I just put in the slide. So you can write this as code. You can run this. Okay, this was the counter. Okay, so hopefully I have uh, uh, somewhat successfully convinced that, uh, you that uh, function reactive programming may be a good idea. Now, how can I use it? So there are several libraries. And one of them is called React Banana. This is the mascot for the library. This is the one that I need. And of course, you have to invest some time first to learn functional reactive programming. But you only have to invest <coughs> as much time as learning these 16 primitive functions. So I've shown you one already, Union Wolf. And filter is similar to the other filter function so that I've shown before. So you almost know two of them. You also know this one. And these functions up here. They are very general and useful in many different contexts. They are useful to know anyway. And then you have, have to invest some time to learn these. And the four down below, you don't need in the beginning. They are a bit more complicated, uh, but at first you don't need them. Okay, and that's it. Once you understand these 16 functions, once you've invested the time to learn them, uh, you can use it all you like. Everything else is just a combination of these functions. Okay, so. Well, this is the situation if you're using Haskell as your language at work. So there are several libraries. One of them are Trinity React Banana. This takes care of the function reactive programming stuff. And the examples I've shown you are written in a library called, uh, called Freepenny GUI, which I've, uh, I'm also been writing. It does this browser stuff, mostly the graphic user interface part. 
And, but there are other libraries too. One of them is called the Flex uh, for the FRP, so Functional Vector Programming FRP, and Reflex DOM for the graphical user interface married uh, to the Functional Vector Programming. So these are links. If you don't know the slides, you can click on them. And there's also a library called FRP Now. So this is by Ryan Trinkle, and this is by Axel van der Flöck. Um, FRP Now is quite recent. Uh, uh, I think it's not quite there yet, but it has solid theoretical underpinnings at least, and I, I'm sure it will be there in a couple of, uh, give it some time. Uh, okay, so now what happens if you can't use Haskell at work? Well, fortunately, you do have options in Java, Star, C++, or so C Sharp. There's a library called Sodium, which also gives you React functional reactive programming in Java, which I think is a great idea. It was implemented by an Australian uh, called Stephen Blackheath and his co-worker Anthony Jones, and they have also written a book uh, about this. So where you can learn about the Sodium library, it's called Functional Reactive Programming, the book. Or the title of the book is Functional Reactive Programming. So uh, if you can't use Haskell at work, then you may get away with this. And uh, from, what, uh, from what he told me, he actually uh, invented his library because he had a huge enterprise application which was not working well and they spent many uh, project months on this trying to get it right and what they did, they uh, reinvented or invented FRP and did everything in Java. Uh, so that now uh, I hear that the project works again. So this was uh, given birth by from a very practical uh, problem and uh, of course, you also have the option of using an entirely different language, and uh, some of you may have already heard the talk on ELM, uh, and this language is, uh, has functional reactive programming built in. So in, the two, uh, in these two options, it's a library, here it is built in. Okay, uh, that's it from my side. The message uh, I want you to take away is that functional reactive programming the key point of this, the core idea, or why it's a good idea, is that you can specify all the dependency at the point of declaration. This avoids spaghetti code, because spaghetti code is, well, you have to look at the whole code base. But here you only have to look at the declarations. Thank you very much. Many functional reactive programming talks today. This morning, React, and we have already Elm, and we'll talk about Elm in our functional reactive programming. So, do you have any questions for Andreas? So, you wrote a uh, reactive banana pretty early, and now, also before, that there was all this clever and stuff that's also on the client side. So, I, I think you got pretty a good overview of the like scenario of different implementation. There is also the functional reactive so there are there are really many libraries. But I think that I mean, in analyzing all these libraries we are missing some abstractions in putting them together, especially for graphical user interfaces. If we see this as a way to connect components, uh, for example as pipes and connectors, I think many people are focusing on the pipes. Mm -hmm. And we are lacking a bit of abstractions on the overall picture. So, also discussion that I see about comparing different approaches, for example, from Helm, from React, all these libraries that are now going also in Haskell to manage uh, an application. They don't just need to cope with the propagation of signals and behaviors and events, but they also need to give an architecture for the state of the application, right? From the roots to the local states of the components. So I was wondering whether you know some higher level, higher order abstraction on top of functional reactive programming. The only thing that I've heard which is similar to this are propagators, which kind of abs try to see how this, the, the overall picture of this network of connected Behaviors and events. I want to know what is your my point of view on this. Uh, okay, so uh, actually, I would split your question into two questions. Uh, one is then uh, you need some kind of uh, primitives that are easy to handle, and I would say uh, the libraries there are so different. So if you have a proper functional reactive programming libra library, it's giving you event and behavior as primitives, and then you can try to build larger, more complex GUIs from that. 
Whereas the React libraries, uh, as I said, um, as a primitive, they are less helpful because uh, or what I've seen from the React family of libraries, they have difficulties uh, coping with the simultaneous event uh, uh, happening. So this, is, this may seem like a small part, but it's very important and it actually makes the implementation of the primitives uh, uh, very difficult. So I've spent uh, over a year at least on figuring out how to do this properly. And I would say, well, the reactive libraries are not doing this as helpful as you could do. And then the second question is, okay, once you have events and behaviors behaving properly, how can you structure a whole GUI from that, a whole graphic user interface, which is of course more complicated than just these primitives. Um, well, to my knowledge, I think Reflex Tom is trying to do some kind of things in this department that the uh, whole DOM tree of the web browser is represented as a behavior, so it changes over time. Um, but to my knowledge, no one has really figured out uh, uh, all of the architect architectural design patterns that you can use for graphical use interfaces. So I, uh, I have uh, a suggestion or two for these. So in, in certain specific cases, like what do you do if you want to have two text boxes that depend on each other? Uh, this, uh, how do you model that in terms of events and behaviors? But for the overall architectural design, it's uh, it's basically a problem that I have never seen anyone solve in total detail yet. So it's, well, if you consider the evolution of graphical user interfaces, then and no one hand really knows how to write a very big graphical user interface. Um, uh, so the key point I would say is that get your primitives right, so that these are simple, and especially have this property that uh, you specify all dependencies at the point of declaration. This makes things, things very simple, and on top of that, you can try to find uh, architectural decisions. Okay. Um, so I, I, I always think that there are kind of like two categories of users of PI release. Mm -hmm. Two scenarios. One is that you use something like PM mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. And the other one is that you want to, like, for example, you have a graphic <coughs> that just does everything in IO and it's on low level. Okay. And then you want to by and then uh, functionalities of that. Yes. Can you do that with the 16 primitives, or, or is, that, is that very easy to react with banana, or what that Ah, okay, so um, the, <laughs> the 16 primitives were for uh, the pure part of functional reactive programming, but a reactive banana also provides uh, uh, even more primitives for connecting to uh, the outside world, to IO. But these are different in style, and you don't use them very often. So uh, I've also written a very small um, glue library. It's called Reactive Banana WX, and it connects Reactive Banana uh, to the VX Haskell libraries. And I've tried to make it very simple. So if you have a GUI library that you already know, like GTK, or you have Cocoa, or whatever, uh, I've tried to make it easy to put Reactive Banana on top of that. So where, where is it? Well, where three penny is more of an integrated package, so to speak. But if you want, if you only want the browser parts, you can use three penny GUI being totally unaware of the uh, function reactive programming parts. That's also possible if you want. For example, one more short question is. Uh, so you mentioned the problem of. Um, events that happen simultaneously and that you um, need to deal with this while you do the union or the merge. Mm -hmm. um, does this union function deal with it or does every event have to specify what happens if it happens simultaneously? So there are different design options for this, so some libraries do differently. Uh, what I finally came down to is that um, in the definition of event, all the occurrences have to occur, occur at different times. So at every moment you have only a single occurrence, and then, uh, so this is single occurrence per time, this is single occurrence per time, and then the union function takes care of the invariant that the events are single occurrence per time, and then you have to apply this combination function. So the answer would be yes, the union function takes care of that. Okay, thank you very much.
short five-minute break, and then we'll be here after five.